you guys just heard, my name is Mike Clough. Uh, have any of you ever heard of the Southern Vermont Natural History Museum before? Yeah! You guys have? Some of you have? Awesome. Very cool. Um, for those of you not familiar with the museum, uh, we're located just down the road. We're like right between Marlboro and Wilmington, right on Route 9. Uh, and today we're going to see some live animals. But most of what we have at the museum is dead stuff. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, we have, we're kind of an old school, old fashioned natural history museum. So we have a bunch of stuffed animals, like taxidermy stuff. Uh, it's actually the largest collection of native birds and mammals in Vermont. We uh, have about 250 species in the collection, uh, about 600 mounted animals. Now, the Dead Animal Museum is not for everybody, right? Yeah, so over the years, we've added rocks, we've added some activities, and we've added a bunch of live animals. Um, we're going to meet some birds of prey today, but if you go to the museum, we also have snakes and turtles and fish and other things like that. Um, one thing that all those live critters and all the dead critters have in common is they're all animals that we can find in the Northeast. We don't have a stuffed tiger. I didn't bring a parrot today. You know, the animals we have are all animals that you guys can see, like, between maybe the mountains of New York and the coast of Maine, right? And most of them, you can see right outside that door. Door. That's a window, right? Yeah, right outside that door. Uh, which we really like, I really like especially. Because, do you guys, actually, before we get going on this, I'm making an assumption here. Do you guys like animals and nature and stuff? Yeah, I like that. Grown-ups, you too? No? The grown ups are like, no. <laughs> uh, have you ever noticed when you watch those TV shows that those animals they're showing us, those cool things, they're from other parts of the world, aren't they? Like, how many of you guys have ever seen a zebra on TV? How many of you ever seen a lion eat that zebra on TV? <laughs> yeah, right? Anybody ever see a zebra in their backyard? On your ride to school in the morning, you guys ever notice that lion walking along the road? No. Now those are amazing animals. You know, we go to, we see in Australia the kangaroos, we see the rainforest, the monkeys, we see all this cool stuff out there. Um, but it's all stuff we're seeing on TV. The real stuff, bless you. The real stuff, the real excitement is right outside. Did you guys know that? You can actually see something new if you go outside. And we do have some pretty cool animals here in Vermont. We have the largest deer in the world here. Did you know that? The world's biggest deer, the moose. We have three different frogs that freeze solid every winter into little frozen frogsicles. And if you dug them up in the middle of winter, you pull them out, you'd be like, oh, cool, little ice cube frog. You bring it inside, it would thaw out and start hopping around. Oh. Yeah, polar bear can't do that. No. We have the world's fastest animal lives right here. Uh, way faster than the cheetah. Oh, yeah. Although, if a cheetah jumped out of a plane, it might compete. Of course, they could only race one time, right? Yeah. I'm talking about a bird of prey, guys, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about some birds of prey, um, or if we want to be more technical, we're going to be talking about some raptors. Have you guys heard of raptors before? Yes. Yeah, somebody, somebody tell me what's a raptor. What's a raptor? Guy with the bat? Yeah. Yeah, a meat eater. That's a good way to start. Well, that's definitely a bird of prey, right? So a bird of prey like a uh, heron or a robin. Yeah, you guys ever think about that? A robin is a hunter. A robin's a bird of prey. And if you don't believe me, ask a worm. <laughs> right? You say, hey, worm, are robins hunters? And those worms will be like, why? Is there one there? Where? Oh, that's scary. What are the types of birds that we usually think of when we think of bird of prey? What are some examples? A bald eagle. eagle. An eagle. Anything else? Falcon. A falcon. Turkey vulture. Ooh, turkey vulture. That's a tricky one. We'll come back to the turkey vulture. Bald eagle. Bald eagle. Yeah, eagles, falcons. A vulture. A vulture. Eagle, falcon, vulture. All right, let's listen to that. We'll come back to vultures. Okay. 
Owls, thank you. How about the hawks? They fit? Yeah. Everything about hawk? But we usually don't think of robins and herons, do we? Okay. Little swallows, usually not. Um, the difference, the thing that separates out a raptor from other birds of prey, those birds you mentioned, the eagles, the hawks, the owls, the falcons, are these feet. This is a foot from a goshawk. Oh my god. And this foot is going to ruin a mouse's whole day. I mean, this is bad news. Big long toenails. Do you guys know the fancy name for those toenails? The talons. You got it. The talons of this goshawk, just like the talons on an owl or an eagle or a falcon, this is what they're going to use to catch their food. Back to vultures. Our vultures here in the U.S., they've got feet like chickens. Yeah, they have chicken feet. They're not grabbing anything, are they? Our vultures are actually more closely related to storks than they are to hawks. Yeah. Yeah, Do you ever, would that be weird to have like vultures delivering babies? That'd be pretty weird. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we can call a vulture a bird of prey because they are meat eaters, right? But they're not raptors. Those raptors, or those vultures back in Africa and Asia and Europe, they're actually really closely related to eagles. They're like eagles that get their head shaped. The real bald, bald eagles, right? And they do have big talons. They don't use them very much, but they do have them. Go. Um, they only eat them if they're dead. That's right, yeah. Vultures are not much for hunting, huh? Yeah. Oh, oh, I know what kind of bird this what is real? Be. The feathers? Yeah, the feathers are real. Yeah. We'll see those a little closer in a minute. Let's meet a raptor. What do you say? Yes. Yeah. They're changing out their feathers right now, so they make a huge mess. And she's probably going to poop on the floor. So be ready for that. Remember, everyone does it, right? Everybody poops. You guys have seen that book? Here we go. Oh, yeah. I told her to go before we left, but she doesn't listen. Yeah. Aren't you glad I wasn't standing like this, though? Right? Yeah. So this hawk is a red-tailed hawk. Uh, you take a look at her. You see those big raptor feet, right? Take a look at her face. That's another thing we're going to look at to recognize a raptor. That hook-shaped beak. Think of an eagle, right? They have that same kind of beak. Now, whereas most birds are using their beaks as a weapon to hunt, a hawk or an owl or an eagle or a falcon, they use their beak as silverware. So if this red-tailed hawk flies down, she uses her powerful feet and catches a rabbit, she can't swallow that rabbit in one gulp, can she? It would be like if you opened up the pizza box and they hadn't cut any slices out of it. You wouldn't just roll it up into a big burrito and try to shove it down your throat, would you? Yeah. What would you do if there were no slices cut in your pizza? Yeah, you'd cut it. You'd take a knife, you'd take a pizza cutter, you'd get it down into manageable sized slices. And that's just what her beak is for. And those are two features all raptors share. They all have that beak, and they all have those feet. Aside from that, there's a lot of things that make them really different. Now, one thing that all of our birds also have in common that I should tell you guys about is all of the animals at the museum, even the snakes and turtles, they're there for some sort of reason. Something happened to make it so they could not survive in the wild. Uh, about 15 years ago, this hawk was flying across the highway. Red-tailed hawks love highways. She was flying across the highway, and what's dangerous about that? Cars. Cars, yeah. And she was hit by a car. That car broke her left wing. And well, look, when she opens up her wings, you guys can see it, right? Her left wing doesn't open up all the way. That's a permanent injury. Her wing healed wrong. So she can't fly anymore. And that's why she's with us. And all the birds you're going to meet today, if you go down to visit the museum, all the animals there, they have some story, some reason they're there. Now, red-tailed hawks are a hawk that we can see quite a bit, partly because they love the highway, right? Uh -huh. You're riding down the road, there they are. Uh, they're big hawks. They like open spaces, so when they're around, they're usually easy to see. They also love farms. They love big fields. They like cities now. They figured out cities. And you can really see red-tailed hawks any place where they can see. Because this is a bird that wants to be able to look out over wide open spaces. Because you know what? Hawks have pretty good eyesight. Did you guys know that? 
Yeah, right? She actually does have eyes like a hawk. It's true. And every hawk, and really every bird, has great eyesight. Pretty much all of them are better than us for their vision. The red-tailed hawk is the best among the hawks. You may be looking at the best daytime eyes in the world right here. This bird has vision eight to ten times sharper than ours. That's twice as good as a bald eagle. She can spot a mouse half a mile down the road. That's a hard thing to picture, though, isn't it? Can you imagine that in your head? I really can't. How about you guys up at Floodbrook? Uh, are all you kids from Floodbrook? Yeah. yeah. No, she knows. Wherever you're from, do you guys have a soccer field at your school? Yeah. Yeah, soccer field. Grown-ups, you may be remembering a football field instead. That works, too. Uh, but we could take her down to the high school. We could send her down in one goal. She'll play goalie for Floodbrook, okay? And she can look all the way down the other end of that soccer field, and she can see a grasshopper playing goalie for the visiting team. A grasshopper at the other end of the soccer field. Now, she doesn't do that with a telescope. She's not zooming in on that little speck. She sees more detail than we can see. She has 10 times our megapixels. Yeah, she sees the grasshopper, but she also sees the leaves on the clover. She sees a little gum wrapper blowing across the field. I look out at you guys, I see your faces. She sees every hair and every eye. Super detailed vision. Full color, she even sees colors we can't see. Yeah, try that. Try to imagine a new color. And I don't mean mixed green and purple. I mean a new color. Go ahead, try it. See, none of you are trying. I know you're not trying because nobody's going, uh. It hurts your head. It really does. Don't try too hard, actually. It hurts your head. Um, but that's really useful, this bird. And it's what she relies on. She depends on that vision to survive out there in the wild. Uh, now, hawks are the raptors we're most likely to run into. Oh, 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 hey, want a feather? There we go. We're actually not allowed to keep the feather. Thank you. <laughs> feather regulations, sorry guys. Um, and uh, something else I should point out too, as we're doing the program today, and we'll, we'll get out to the next bird here in a second, but as we're doing the program, if you guys have questions, like I know you've been waiting on one, um, don't be shy about that. We can do some question and answer here during the program. If it gets too crazy, we'll run out of time though, okay? So let's not share stories yet. Let's wait till the end for stories and comments. How's that sound, everybody? Yeah. All right, and right away I had a couple hands come up. Go. Are they better than a deer's eyes? Are they better than a deer's eyes? Well, a hawk has much better vision during the day than a deer, but at night, her night vision's terrible. So a deer does much better than this hawk does at night. Her night vision's worse than ours. Yeah. Really, most animals get a trade-off. Did you guys know that? And there's basically a trade-off. The better your night vision is, the worse your daytime, your color vision is. And the better your color vision is, the worse your night vision is. And this hawk's way up at the top, a daytime vision. So she's real near the bottom on night vision. Yes? Why is it called a red? Why is it called a red-tailed hawk? Mm. Oh, because, because, like, Actually, you know why? Because reddish-brown-tailed hawk was too long for the bird book. So they shortened it down to red, yeah? Uh, and some red-tailed hawks will have a brighter red tail than this. Some will have a tail that's more brown or more orange. Yeah, that's, that's basically why. Because it's more red than anything else. Yes? Since she was injured 15 years ago, how long did they live? Uh, in captivity, a red-tailed hawk can live into her 30s. Uh, she was an adult when she got hit. She had that reddish tail. Um, they get that for their second birthday. So she is at least 17 years old. She could be 30 right now. You know, we really don't know. We know she's at least 17. And in the wild, for a red-tailed hawk to live 17 years is exceptional. Uh, most of these birds will live two to three times longer in captivity than they do in the wild. Most red-tailed hawks, if they hit 10 years old, they're doing fantastic. Yes? Where did you get it? Where do we get her? Well, after she got hit by the car, some people found her, and they brought her to Vince. You guys all know Vince, right? Yeah. yeah nobody knows New Zealand. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah. They brought her to Vince, and Vince does, you guys know, right? They help injured animals. If you find an injured animal, take it to Vince. That's a great thing to do. Um, unfortunately, they weren't able to fix the wing. So they kept her for a few years and used her for programs like we do. Uh, and then about eight or nine years ago, they decided to get rid of her, 
and she came to live with us instead. Yes? Um, how sharp are the talons? How sharp are the talons? The talons on these birds, as they grow, they get sharper. They spiral while they grow. So her talons, they got, she got a toenail clipping not too long ago, so they're not needle sharp. But if we left her alone, they would grow to be needle sharp. Yeah. And the feet on a raptor are, are incredibly strong. The general rule is, you see the length of the talon? That's how deep it can sink in. That's why I'm wearing a glove. Yes, sir? What's her name? What's her name? Good question. Uh, she does not know it. Uh, but a few years ago, we did a big crazy naming the animal Facebook suggestion polls thing. Uh, and she ended up with Piper. Which I kind of like that. Piper. Right, you guys want to meet another bird? Yeah. So, hawks come in, in a variety of different kinds of hawks. Uh, the red tail is a soaring hawk, an open country bird. Long, broad wings, relatively short tail. That's the hawk you see circling up in the sky. Uh, there's another group of hawks, they're the forest hawks. They have long, skinny tails, short wings. These guys are the motorcycles of the hawk world. High acceleration, incredible maneuver maneuverability. They zip through the woods catching other birds. How hard is that? That's pretty crazy hard. Um, this hawk we're going to meet right now is not one of those hawks. They're, those are the excipiters. Um, this is a red-shouldered hawk. And a red-shouldered hawk is part of that same soaring hawk family. But she lives in the woods. And since she lives in the woods instead of out in the field, she has a longer tail. Do you guys know what a bird does with its tail? What's a tail for a bird? Look how sharp her talons are. Oh, what does a bird do with its tail? Yes. Keeps it balanced. Keeps it balanced. And as I'm walking around, you'll see they're moving their tails to keep their balance. There's something else they use it for, though, when they're flying. Yes? Um, the owls, yeah, yeah, but every bird does something else with that tail. Um, how did, how did This is a question. We'll get to you, don't worry. <laughs> yes? The tail is for turning. Yeah, for turning, for steering. A longer tail, unless you're talking about like a crazy peacock tail, but a longer tail makes it so you can steer better. Why would you want to steer well if you live in the woods? So you don't hit a tree. So you don't hit a tree, exactly. Now we had a question right there. Um, how, did, how did she get injured? Well, this hawk just last year um, got hit by a car, and the car smacked her right in the head. Um, and it blinded her in one eye, and we think it messed her brain up a little bit too. Uh, because we're trying to move her in with the red tail, and the red tail wants to eat her, and she doesn't even care. She's like, oh, hey, big giant hawk coming right at me. How's it going? <laughs> We're working on it though. That red tail has lived with other red shoulder hawks before. We're keeping them under tight supervision. And hopefully they'll get along. Uh, you might notice too, this hawk is missing one of her talons. Um, that happened while she was in rehab. She injured that toe and she lost her back talon. Now that back talon is called the helix. And on a hawk, that's the most important talon. Because that's the static talent. That's the one she's really catching that food with. Uh, yes? Yeah, she's still blind in one eye. Yeah. See, it's right on my thumb. You see how she's missing that back toenail? So, what is this kid doing? So, you guys might have noticed too, you know how calm that red tail was? She's a little more twitchy, isn't she? Yeah, she doesn't do a whole lot of programs for us, but I thought you guys might like to see her, because we are trying to get her out more. Uh, they're also a hawk, guys, that as Vermont has changed over the years. You know, 100, 150 years ago, none of these trees were out here. Did you guys know that? Yeah. Yeah, the settlers came to New England and they cut all the trees down. Red tail hawks loved that. They all they probably didn't have any red tail hawks in Vermont before that happened. 
They all moved in, they're like, woo, I can see for miles. The red-shouldered hawks who lived here before that, what do you think they thought? This is terrible. This is awful. Let's get out of here. Now the trees are back, and the red-shouldered hawks are coming back too. They're becoming one of our most common hawks. So they're a little harder to see than a red tail because they're more in the woods. But keep your eyes open. This bird is still pretty young. She doesn't have all her red yet. She'll get a red chest. She'll have red shoulders and back. She can see red on her head even. Uh, she is getting her grown-up tail feathers. You guys see those black and white striped feathers? Yeah. And in her wings, let's see if she'll open her wings for us. See how some of her wing feathers are stripy black and white and others have different colors? You guys see that? You know which ones are the new feathers? The black and white one, yeah. She is starting to become an adult. And a lot of hawks do that. When they're young, they're colored differently than mom and dad. And that's really important. Because hawks and owls, they really don't like each other very much. Yeah. And if Mr. and Mrs. Hawk, red-shouldered hawk, have their nest, and they see a stranger coming through the woods, you know what they're going to do? They're going to attack. They're going to go out. They're going to beat up that trespasser. But if they look at that other hawk and they say, oh, wait a minute. That hawk does not have a black and white striking tail. That hawk is not all red on her chest and shoulders yet. She's just a kid. All right, you may pass. And they'll let her hang around a little bit, and they won't beat her up. And that gives this hawk a chance to learn how to hunt. Because nature plays really rough, especially if you're a hunter. Imagine if you're like a one-eyed rabbit, right? And you're like, ah, oh, a strawberry. Oh, I missed. Oh, I missed. Oh, I got it. Can a hawk do that? No. Then the hawk flies down to grab the mouse. She's only got one eye. She can't tell quite where it is. She misses. The mouse isn't like, ha, ha, good try, buddy. Go again. Right? <laughs> they don't do that. They like, <laughs> they like They're like, I'm out of here. Shoom, like, gone. And the hawk doesn't get to eat. That's like yes. Like what eye is she blind in? Can you what guess? Else? Yeah, it's hard to tell. They look pretty much the same. But it's her left eye. And usually in North America, the eye injuries, the wing injuries, are on the left side. Why? Because we drive on the right side of the road. In England, most of the injuries are on the right side. Now you're driving down the road, right? And something comes from the left, so it's right side is facing you. It has to go across the whole lane before it gets to you, right? So that bird has a better chance to see you. You have a better chance to say, whoa, I almost hit a hawk. Whereas if they come from the right, so their left side is facing you, they come out of the woods, boom, they're right in front of the car. Right? So a lot more of them get hit on that side. Yes? Um, why is her beak so blue? Why is her beak so blue? That's the color of her beak. Yeah, that's just the color of her beak. Yeah, it's kind of blue-black, isn't it? Yeah, I like her too. She's a pretty bird. Our dog is terrified of this bird for some reason. How could you tell she was going to poop? Looks like it. You know how you can tell when a bird is going to go to the bathroom? Like when it's back, when its tail lifts up? Because they don't want to poop on their tail, right? So I kind of make her do it. I'll roll my hand because that balance, she's going to lift her tail to keep her balance. But that's what it would look like if she was going to poop. Good information to have. Yes? Yeah. Now those are her kid markings, those little hearts on her chest. She's losing those, and it's going to get all like this in the future. Oh, whoa. She's going to lose those spots and those little hearts. Oh, her bird is. Jamaica. How long have you had her? She's coming We now. got this bird, um, you all right? We got this bird at the uh, last fall, and when we got her, she was sent to us from another rehabilitation center, um, and when she came to us, she broke a bunch of tail feathers, and she ended up breaking off like her whole tail, right? And it looked terrible, and so I didn't take her out very much because I'd have to explain her tail was all broken every time. Uh, but look, she's growing in a new tail. It's beautiful now. Yeah. Is this the bird we uh, you got out? So how old is she? She's two years old now. She's just getting her grown up colors. Excuse me? Yes, sir. How, how big does your container have to be for a turkey? How big would the box have to be for a turkey? Probably bigger than this, yeah. 
Then I would just get their but their towns we should see right here. Oh my god. Before I say anything else, I should let you guys know this is not a baby bird. She is a full grown falcon. She is the American kestrel, our littlest falcon. And you can tell she's a falcon right away. Um, our North American, well, our United States falcons all have racing stripes. You guys see those black stripes across her eyes? Because falcons are fast, they are built for speed. Long pointed wings. Long skinny tails. The fastest animal on the planet is her big cousin, the peregrine falcon. You guys ever heard of that? Yeah. You've seen peregrine falcons? Isn't it awesome? Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful birds. In a vertical dive, peregrine falcons can hit speeds of over 200 miles an hour. As fast as a race car, guys. They're incredible animals. Uh, Peregrine falcons, and really most falcons, are bird eaters. Like some of you might know this bird is the sparrow hawk, because she will go after little birds. Uh, but most of what a kestrel is eating are things on the ground. So imagine a 200 mile an hour dive ending on a mouse crossing the street. That will kill it. Yeah, you only get to do it one time. I've heard it described as a feathered pancake, right? <laughs> So kestrels don't go anywhere near that fast, and really they probably couldn't, uh, but still she's fast. She can fly in flat flight and still hit speeds of about 60 miles an hour. Just flying, she can probably beat the fastest runner, right? And that's without even tucking into a dive. Yes? Excellent question. What happened to this bird? Um, as we look at her, she looks pretty good, doesn't she? Yeah. Well, she's growing some new tail feathers in there. So she has a kind of uneven tail. Uh, but her handicap is a serious one, but it's also kind of a weird one. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with her body at all. Her wings work great, her eyes, her feet, her ears, everything works perfect with her body. Any guesses what's wrong with it? Brain. So these guys are shouting it out over here. Her brain, yeah. Our kestrel has mental problems. Mm. Sounds weird, doesn't it? You want, want me to explain? Okay, cool. It, it's something that really can happen to any bird. It's called imprinting. Some of you probably heard of that. Uh, like chickens and ducks are really famous for it. A uh, baby chick pops out of the egg. She looks around. If it's big and it's moving, it's mom. And she follows that dog right across the barn here. Uh, other birds imprint later in life. For a kestrel, when she's about 13 days old. Now, this bird was from the Northeast Kingdom in Vermont, uh, and when she turned 13 days old, she was living in somebody's kitchen. Yeah, we don't know the details, we don't know exactly how it happened. Maybe the tree fell down, and the lady went, oh no, baby kestrels, I must save them. Or maybe in the dark of night, she climbed up into the nest and stole the baby. We don't know. But we do know, when this bird's eyes came into sharp focus, she looked up and said, hey, thanks for all the grasshoppers. You must be my mom. She looked at a human being. And it locked into her little brain, my mom's human. So logically, what is she? Human. She's human. Top of the food chain. Woo! That's awesome to be human. That's a score. Uh, but she's wrong, isn't she? Yeah, she's not human. Now, those chickens and ducks who imprint right away, they pop out of the egg like, hey, mom, let's go. For some reason, when those birds grow up, there comes a day where they kind of look around and go, I am a chicken. I need to go be a chicken. Birds who imprint later, like a parrot is a great example of this, actually. If any of you know anyone or if you have a pet parrot, they're imprinted. And they will be for their entire life. She's about nine years old now. She's a great, great grandma, Kestrel. She still thinks she's human. And every spring, her body, which works perfectly, tells her, time to find a boyfriend. Let's lay some eggs. And you know what her messed up little brain does? She starts checking you guys out. Yeah. People often ask if I am her boyfriend. I actually am not. I'm like her fourth choice. She seems to like long, dark hair the best. So maybe. Spring. I don't know. Um, 
She definitely seems like the long, dark hair, which makes us think that the person who hand raised her probably had long, dark hair, because she's a visual creature, right? Those daytime raptors are all depending on their eyes. Her sense of smell, eh, doesn't really have one. Her sense of hearing is about as good as ours. She has a wider range. She hears sounds we can't hear, but not necessarily quieter sounds than we can hear. And these are amazing little falcons. What do you think? Cool. You guys, any more questions? How do I get her to raise her wings? Um, have you ever seen those guys like log rolling stuff? Now, I used to work for a guy who did uh, big bird prey shows, and he had this big golden eagle. And he would say, do you guys want to see her seven-foot wingspan? And everybody would be like, yeah! And he'd be like, you forgot the magic word. And if people would say, please, and he'd do this. And she'd pop those big wings open. And everyone was like, oh, she understood us. And he never told them what he had done. But yeah, if I roll my hand, she'll open her wings, just like if you're going, whoa. Right? Some people go like that. I don't, that doesn't seem nice, does it? No, just roll. Questions? No? Right. Yes, ma'am? Um, can we hold it? Can we hold it? No, I'm sorry. It's actually against the rules. Yeah. The federal government and the insurance company say no touching the bird's prey. And if they both say it, we can have a follow it. Uh, you guys want to see another bird? Yeah! Is that going to be gay? You know, I don't know about you guys, but I, I think the daytime birds of prey, we're pretty much done with that. Want to see somebody who works at night? These guys are not big fans of snow. So where we do have screech owls, it's the parts of the state that have the least amount of snow. So like the Champlain Valley, the Southern Connecticut River Valley, that's where we're going to find screech owls usually. Uh, not, although someone was telling me they had one behind their house in Wilmington, uh, which is a little higher elevation than you expect to see them, but it's possible. Uh, it is hard to tell when there are screech owls in your neighborhood. Why do you think that is? Because you can't hear the screech. <laughs> well, well, we'll come back to the sounds, because that's actually the best way to tell. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but can it, like, turn the, um, the it sure can, yeah. Yes. Why do you guys think, why would it be hard to tell if there's owl lives behind your house? Oh, did you guys hear that? This guy in the back knows that this owl is most active at night. And it's hard for us to tell what's going on out there in the dark, isn't it? We're not really built for that. But let's say this owl was sitting in that big old maple tree down the road from your house, just kind of nestled in there against the bark. What do you think, guys? He's bark colored. Owls have great camouflage. And this little screech owl will spend the day just kind of huddled in there with his eyes closed. And they disappear. At night, they got the name screech owl because they are noisy. And you can hear them at night. Every owl has its own call. Uh, one of the calls of the screech owl kind of sounds like a horse whinnying. So if there's a horse whinnying in a tree behind your house some night, maybe it's a screech owl. Either way, pretty exciting, right? Uh, and they also have a call, people describe it as the trill or the bounce call. I can kind of do it, it sort of sounds like... Kind of like that. Uh, Google it, we'll see. Uh, and those calls, those calls the owls are making, for the most part what they're doing is they're saying, this is my territory, if you're not my girlfriend or boyfriend, take off. Again, birds of prey don't like each other very much. Uh, so if you hear an owl call, and you can imitate that, and with the other owl, it's easier call. We, we'll learn that one, okay? You guys want to learn that one? Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. 
Um, it's an easier call to learn. And if you can hoot back, or whinny back, or trill back, or beep, some of them sound like trucks backing up. Um, if you can imitate that call, that owl's going to think you're a stranger. And he's going to want to come chase you out. And you might get to see that bird come up close. So, yes. And what, what happened? What happened to this owl? Uh, this owl also was very young, and no one's really sure how it happened, but he was found walking around the backyard before he could really fly. Uh, this is normal for owls. Owls have this big time when they're called branchers. Yeah, weird, right? They jump out of the nest, but they can't fly yet. So usually they climb around in the branches of the tree, right? And they get hungry and they go, Mom! And she's like, ugh. And then she comes and feeds them. Uh, this bird ended up on the ground. Now the people who found him did the right thing. They called the wildlife rehabilitator. And they said, I've got a baby owl. What do I do? Now normally, the rehabber would say, get it off the ground so the cats don't kill it. Mom's there. Don't worry about it. For some reason, this person said, bring the owl to me. And that's actually really good for this guy, because when they got the owl, they discovered that he's blind in his left eye. He has a detached retina. Now, eye injuries in owls are really common. This bird's eyeballs outweigh his brain. Yeah. If I was an owl with a head this big, my eyes would be the size of grapefruit. Crazy, right? Huge eyeballs. Their eyes are so big. They have a special bone that grabs the back of their eyeball to keep it from falling out of their head. So it's good. That's good. What it means, though, is the owl cannot do something we can all do with his eyes. He has a bone grabbing a hold of the back of that eye. Can you guys do this? Move your eyes around, right? He can't. He cannot move his eyes. So to look around, the owl has to turn its head. Like right now, we know exactly what he's looking at because it's where his nose is pointing. Come on, look over there. Hi. Because he can't move those eyes. Now we know the owls are really good at turning their heads. Most owl, well, owls can turn their heads about three quarters of the way around. 270 degrees. So you start straight ahead. Try this, guys. Try it. Look straight ahead, turn your head to the left, go around the back, put your chin on your right shoulder. Nobody? No, no, the next shoulder. Keep going. No, 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 we can't. You know why we can't do it? Our necks are too short. We only have seven bones in our neck. The owl has 14. He has as many bones in his neck as a swan. If a swan turned its head around backwards, big deal, right? A big snaky neck on it. The owl has just as many bones in its neck. Now, having those huge eyes give the owl a big advantage, though, after dark. Because those big eyes help that owl see at night. This bird has good enough night vision. He can see well enough to fly through the woods by starlight. Starlight through the woods. You get a big full moon up in the sky, midnight is daytime to this bird. Great night vision. Now, owls often don't rely on that eyesight as much as a hawk does. A screech owl kind of does. Screech owls are pretty visual for owls. Um, and we can kind of guess that. If you see an owl with these feathers on their head, they're usually more of an eyeball-focused owl. And those feathers help them communicate a little bit. Yeah. You can tell what kind of mood an owl's in by where those feathers are, if they have them. Imagine it was a cat or a horse, right? And you saw it had its ears like that. What would it mean? Uh, it's mad. It's upset. Oh, dude, stay upset. There he goes. He's mad. He's upset. Same for the owl. He cheers up. Boom. There we go. Now he's happy. Angry. Happy. It's so easy to cheer up the screech owl. Uh, the difference, though, is if his eyes are closed, then he's hiding. And sometimes a screech owl will just sit on a branch. It'll stand up really straight. It'll pull its feathers in tight to its body. It'll close its eyes. It'll stand those feathers up. And it'll just sit there. And he's thinking, 
I am a broken branch. You cannot see me. I am a broken branch. And it works great. It's great camouflage. By breaking up his outline with those feather tufts, it helps him hide. Yes, ma'am? Can we see him turn his head all the way around? I don't know if he wants to. He likes looking at you. And he's opening his mouth. Oh, almost. Yeah. Oh. oh, now he's mad. Oh, oh. Sure, dude. There you go. <laughs> yes? There's different kinds of owls in the world. Like barn yeah. owls, too. That's right. There are a lot of different kinds of owls. Yeah. Well, we have seven owls that nest in Vermont and four more who visit. Easy to remember. 7 Eleven. Um, and our biggest owl who lives here is the great horned owl. The great horned owl is like a screech owl as big as the red-tailed hawk. Who's brown? They are the craziest of all the owls. Oh yes. Great horned owls eat skunks. Yeah, delicious if you have no sense of smell, right? Uh, sometimes they'll attack porcupines or turkeys. Things they should not be going after. Those are usually young, crazy, great horned owls. A turkey is really dangerous. It absolutely is. Yeah, but the back tail thing on their like bottom part right here. Yeah, they have those spurs, yeah. Yeah, they use those things called that with other male birds, right? Uh-huh, yeah. Or they can use the beak. most numerous owl in Vermont. He's named for the bars or the stripes on his chest. He's the barred owl. I knew it! The barred owl is the owl most of us see. Have you guys ever seen an owl like this out in the world? No. No? Someone else? Yeah. Dude. Aren't you glad I wasn't standing right here? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, is the owl we see most here in Vermont? Uh, one of the reasons owls aren't out much during the day has a lot to do with their feathers. You guys, I mean, maybe somebody can help me out here. Some of you camp kids right here. We have a couple wings. Uh, the black one is a raven wing. Ah, uh, it's just a peregrine wing. The pointy wing is a peregrine falcon wing. The brown one is a barred owl wing, like this owl. You guys all have a chance to check this stuff out, don't worry. But right now, can you girls feel these wings? Do they feel the same or do they feel different? You gotta feel both of them. Same or different? Different. Different? How would you describe the difference? Uh, one's hard and one's soft. Which one's the soft one? It's that one. That one? one. Ew. Ew. I love it when that. You put a fist inside my ear hole. Ew! Ew! But kind of cool, right? <laughs> His ears, in real life, this bird's ear openings are about three times the size of ours. He weighs a little over a pound. So huge ear holes. And instead of one of these to get sound into those ears, he's using his face. That whole face can cut forward and funnel sound into those big ears. We can kind of see what that's like by putting our hands behind our ears. And I can only do one. You guys can do two. Put your hand behind your ears. I'm just going to keep blabbing away up here. Go outside. Nature is awesome. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. Take your hands away. Put them back. You know, just check it out. Do you guys see the difference? What happens? You want your hands behind your ears. Like it gets that. louder. It gets louder. Imagine if your whole head was doing that. And that's what the owl's face does. Funnel sound in those big ear openings. So we can hear those incredibly quiet sounds. Can we do the crooked ears? Do you guys want to know why his ears are crooked, though? Because that's weird, right? You ever seen an animal with crooked ears before? No. Have you ever seen a dog? Or if you watch those nature shows, see like a fox, you know they do this? Yeah. They're trying to be owls. They're trying to give themselves crooked ears. Because with crooked ears, you can hear where a sound is. Real quick, okay. Pretend I'm an owl, my big old facial disc on, right? That big round face of feathers. Let's say there's a mouse out in the hall there somewhere. The sound comes through the air. My dish catches it, boom, funnels it into the top ear. And the top ear is like, okay, owl, wake up. We got a mouse straight ahead and down. Go get him. The sound is the bottom ear, and the bottom ear is like, no, 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 no. It's not straight ahead and down. That mouse is just over the right a little bit. 
And that owl's brain will kind of draw a line to where each ear thinks the mouse is, and those lines will cross. Yeah. Guess what you find at the X? It's a lot right in the mouse. So that owl can listen to that snow-covered field, and it can hear. There's a mouse, 30 feet ahead of me, six inches under the surface of the snow, drop through the ceiling with these big feet, and ruin that mouse's whole night. Owls don't need to migrate. At least, most owls don't need to migrate. We sometimes see snowy owls here in the winter, right? Snowy owls will come down to Vermont, out of Canada, uh, mostly because Canada winters are serious. And those are usually young owls, and they come down to sunny Vermont for the winter, where it's easy. Yeah, where it's easy. Yes? How did the owl get hurt? He was hit by a car, too. Yeah, they say about a million animals a day are hit by cars in the U.S. Yeah, that's a lot, isn't it? And if you go on a long trip, though, this is kind of a grim car game, but if you go on a long trip, look at the roadkill, and it's believable. You know, Sometimes I wonder if they're counting butterflies and stuff with that, but I don't think so. No, I think it's backboned critters. Yes, ma'am? Would he be sleeping now if he wasn't being shown? Good question. Um, he would definitely be relaxing right now. You know, most animals don't sleep like we do. You know, we zonk out for eight hours, and then we're up again. Most animals kind of doze. They nap. Uh, out there, the barred owls that are on the hills around us right now, and there are barred owls out there, they're pretty much resting. And that way, if something comes along that's dangerous to them, it can't catch them, right? They hear that raccoon climbing the tree, and they go, whoa, <laughs> no, see ya. And then they can move. Um, yeah, sleeping like we do is dangerous out there in the woods. Uh, but the reason he's as active as he is, just like you just said, he's, he's on the clock now. Yeah, he's at work. Yep. I just saw an owl, like, under its feet, yeah. now. Yeah, that's, uh, he's panting. And you know, like, when a dog pants to cool off, birds do the same thing. Yeah, it's hot in here. He's wearing a down jacket. Um, Actually, feathers are really good for hot or cold weather. He can adjust those feathers so the airflow will pass through and cool him off very well. Not a lot of airflow in here, so that's probably not working quite as well as he'd like. Yep. Which part of it is the guy? Which part? Oh, his head. Yeah, he's blind in one eye, too. Remember, eyes are the biggest grapefruit, right? This eye. And most of his head is just feathers, folks. You know, huge, giant eyes. Protected by feathers. Uh, impact and eye injuries are real common in owls. Back row. Trying to possess me. It did possess me years ago. everywhere. I know, right? Here, we'll grab a paper towels before you guys get Alright, so you guys have been sitting here for a while, huh? Yeah, um, this is the last bird I brought. I see we've got a couple more questions out there. So let's hit those questions. Go, sir. Um, is the owl, when did you get in the car accident, or die? Well, this owl got in a car accident and he survived. Yeah, yeah. he got hurt. These guys are tough. Yeah, they're pretty tough. Yes? How come it's like right here? Right here, it goes like Yeah, well, that's he's panting. He's trying to cool off. Yes? Sure, yeah, that's what owls do the most. Owls are mostly out at night. Yeah? Yep. How old is this owl? How old is this owl? We don't know. He got hit by a car about seven years ago. Uh, and actually, the wildlife rehabilitator had him uh, contact us and said, hey, do you guys have room for another barred owl? I've got this great owl. And we didn't have room at the time. Uh, and so we helped, we put these straps on it because most rehabilitators, when they get an animal that they can't release, they have to find a new home for it or they have to put it down, right? They have to put it to sleep or euthanize it. Um, he really liked this owl. He didn't want to do that. So we were trying to help him in any way he could to find a new home for it. But there are a lot of barred owls out there. And this past winter, one of our barred owls died. So I called him and said, hey, uh, 
you know, if you end up with an owl that's non-releasable, we have room now. We, we could take an owl. And he was like, oh, could you take Alistair? I was like, wait a minute, Alistair? That bird from like seven years ago? He's like, yeah, I haven't been able to find it at home. He probably wasn't supposed to keep it for seven years. Uh, but now he lives with us. Yeah. So, yes? Why aren't they asleep right now? Uh, well, imagine you're sleeping. You're in your bed, you're dreaming, you're sound asleep, and someone comes in and they go, hey, what's your name? Ethan. Hey, Ethan, wake up. We're going to school in the middle of the night today. What would happen? Yes. You'd wake up and go to school in the middle of the night, right? Um, and that's with this guy. You probably, you guys probably know people who work nights, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, he does, he works days. So he's up working right now. Yeah, when we go back to the museum, uh, we'll put him back in his enclosure, and he'll go over into his shady, spotty legs, and he'll just kind of relax for the day. Yes? Um, one, you said we, you also have, like, turtles and snakes here? Yeah, yeah, well, not here. At the museum, we have them. Yeah? I didn't, we didn't get to see that bridge on one car. No, well, you guys can, you, if we have, I don't know about the camp, but if you guys have time, you can check this stuff out. Uh, there is something that we're starting to work with this bird on. Um, because his only problem is his eye, he has perfect flight, and we're starting to try to get him to think of this as his safe place, because that's really what owls want during the day. And once he locks in, once he's like, yeah, that's my safe place, you know what we'll be able to do? We'll be able to let him fly to it. Yeah. And he has perfect flight. So if, say, he flew across the room, you guys could see him fly and not hear it, which is pretty exciting. We're very early in that now, so we're, no, we're not, we don't trust him. We're going to have a little leash, but you guys want to see if he wants to hop in there? Yeah. yeah. All right. What? That was really quick. We all we weren't even paying attention yet. Here, let's see if he'll do it again. Oh, he doesn't know how to come out. All right, you guys ready? Yeah. Yeah. All right. See, he's not looking at it, so we don't trust him. Okay. Oh, right. And now we want to reward him, right? By locking him in. That's the reward. We close the door. And now he's in a safe, quiet spot, right? That's what he wants during the day. He wants a safe, quiet spot. We gave it to him. And who knows, next time... Maybe he'll fly a little further. We did try this once without the leash, and he ended up like in the back of the room on some guy's head. So <laughs> back to square two. All right. Uh, so, folks, those are the birds I brought with me today. I hope you liked meeting them. Did you like meeting them? Yes. I do want to apologize, though. We didn't get to see the barred owls raise babies in the backyard. The hawk did not grab a snake off your lawn. The amazing, incredible things that our wildlife can do and is doing every day, I can't do it here. But if, it, if I can make it up to you, I can tell you where you can see those things. I can tell you where that happens and much, much more. Outside. Go outside. Seriously. If you go outside and spend some time out there wandering around, looking around, checking stuff out, I promise you will see something new. You spend enough time, you might see something new to everybody. Seriously. There are new things being discovered every day. Some of you are looking at me real skeptical. I'm not talking about the rainforest, right? 100 bugs a day. I'm not talking about that. Um, here's an example. This college kid had to do a report on lizards. So he decided, instead of going to the library, he was going to find out what kind of lizards lived on the hill behind the school. And that was going to be his report. I like that guy. So he goes up on the hill and he starts catching lizards. He did not go into the wilderness. He did not go out into the national parks. He went on the hill directly behind the college. Do you think people had ever been there before? Yeah. Yeah, of course, tons of people had. He discovered six kinds of lizard no one knew who lived there. He discovered six new lizards behind the college. 
Do you guys think, is it possible, there's something new right out there? Yeah. yeah, totally. Can we Google it and say, what is the animal in South Londonderry no one knows lived there? No. That's super disappointing, trust me. You don't get good results. Is there a documentary on the unknown wildlife of Vermont? No, because no one would know Because no one knows, exactly. Do you know how we can find that stuff out? Go out there, go do it. It's summer. It's the perfect time to run around in the woods and find new things. So, hope you guys liked meeting the critters. Come visit us at the museum on some horrible stormy day. Otherwise, get outside and learn some stuff, okay? You guys do that? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you all very much for coming out tonight.